Hello again, and welcome back to the Slow Flowers Podcast with Deborah Prinzen, episode 507. This is the weekly podcast about slow flowers and the people who grow and design with them. It's all about making a conscious choice, and I invite you to join the conversation and the creative community as we discuss the vital topics of saving our domestic flower farms and supporting a floral industry that relies on a safe, seasonal, and local supply of flowers and foliage. This podcast is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 880 florists, shops, studios, and creators who design with local, seasonal, and sustainable flowers, and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor for 2021, Farm Girl Flowers. Farm Girl Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting more than 20 U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $9 million of U.S.-grown fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually, and providing competitive salaries and benefits to team members based in Watsonville, California, and Miami, Florida. Discover more at farmgirlflowers.com. For each podcast episode this year, we also thank three of our major sponsors. Our first sponsor thank you goes to Mayesh Wholesale Florist. Family owned since 1978, Mayesh is the premier wedding and event supplier in the U.S. And we're thrilled to partner with Mayesh to promote local and domestic flowers, which they source from farms large and small around the U.S. Learn more at Mayesh.com. The Slow Flower Summit is one month away. It's really impossible to believe as I speak that sentence, especially after having to postpone the 2020 summit, which would have been our fourth consecutive year holding a live in-person gathering to celebrate Slow Flower Society and American Flowers Week. Alas, as each of you knows, little took place last year. However, as we enter 2021, with the availability of vaccinations and some incredibly creative event planning by Karen Thornton, our summit event manager, along with the leadership at Filoli Historic House and Garden, we can now joyously proclaim that the Slow Flower Summit 2021 will take place soon, June 28th through 30th. You have met many of our speakers on past episodes of the Slow Flowers podcast, but in the coming weeks, you will hear from several others. Consider this an introduction and a preview of their presentations coming up. Today, I invited two of the three panelists who are going to be part of the Sustainable Farming and Floral Design panel. What I envisioned as a conversation about how sustainable farming practices influence design choices, aesthetics, and style. At the summit, you'll hear from each presenter, and they'll share personal journeys through farming to floral design. They'll also share a little visual inspiration and demonstrate a signature arrangement using all locally grown seasonal flowers. Kelly Matsushita Singh will be moderating the panel, joined by Emily Sager and Molly Culver. Today's episode features a conversation with Kelly and Emily. Molly was unable to join us, but I have a few bonuses for you. Since Molly has appeared on the podcast twice in the past, I'll share those interview links in today's show notes for episode 507 at deborahprinzing.com. You can go back and listen to those. First, let me tell you a bit about Kelly and Emily, and then we'll jump right into the conversation. Kelly Matsushita Singh is a queer fourth-generation Japanese-Chinese farmer. They are an educator and instructor at the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems, also known as CASFIS, at UC Santa Cruz, training folks to grow a variety of fabulous fruits, flowers, and vegetables. They train growers in flower production, design, and sales for fresh markets and special events. They believe that cut flowers should be accessible to everyone, both for their cultural and spiritual significance, as well as for their beauty and sensory delight. Kelly is delighted to be part of creating a flower movement that is rooted in social and environmental justice. They are currently enamored by California's native Matalia poppy and excited to continue exploring design possibilities with other great native plants. Emily Sager is a Filoli horticulture alumni and currently is pursuing a master's in landscape architecture at the University of Washington. 
Emily has eight years of horticulture experience blending production agriculture, landscape maintenance, gardening, and floral design. She has worked for several notable Bay Area farms, including Fifth Crow Farm, Bluma Farm, and Hidden Villa. Prior to entering the landscape architecture program in the fall of 2020, Emily served as the lead horticulturist at Filoli, where she looked after the rose garden, the cutting garden, and the orchard. Her design aesthetic is a blending of her work experience, foraged and cultivated, wild and formal, always designed with seasonality and senescence in mind. A strong believer in the healing powers of nature through her gardens and floral design, Emily hopes to facilitate this connection for all. I'm excited to introduce both of these guests with you. Let's jump right in and hear more. And you'll also find photographs and social media links in today's show notes for episode 507 at deborahprinzing.com. Welcome back to the Slow Flowers podcast with Deborah Prinzing. And I'm so excited today to start talking about the Slow Flower Summit coming up June 28th through 30th. Yes, it's happening live and in person uh, at Filoli Historic House and Garden in Woodside, California, which is right outside of San Francisco. And I'm going to be be inviting uh, some of our speakers to come on and talk a little bit about themselves and their work uh, as we lead up to the summit dates. And so what I'm really excited about is we have a panel that we've Gosh, we've been talking about forever because we had to postpone the summit, but it's going to be moderated by my first guest, uh, Kelly Matsushita Singh. And uh, hi, Kelly. How are you? It's great to see you here. Hi, good morning. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. And so uh, Kelly and I talked about, well, we talked about this like mid or maybe fall of 2019, it feels like ages ago, of doing a a panel of people who are involved in sustainable farming and sustainable growing practices, but who are also designers. So um, this is called Sustainable Farming X Floral Design. So thanks for saying you'll lead that panel, Kelly. And uh, I'll introduce our one of your panelists, Uh, we might have a third one joining us, uh, or a a third person joining us. But um, right now, I also want to introduce Emily Sager. Hi, Emily. Good morning, Deborah. Thanks for having me. You bet. And I'm I'm really psyched that you're with us too. So first of all, let's start out and just tell everybody who you are. Give us a snapshot of where, you know, where you are in the floral and, and farming space. Um, Emily, I'll uh, go ahead and get started with you because your position has changed. You were a staff horticulturist at Filoli when we, when Kelly and I first started talking about this panel and um, things have changed for you, but you've graciously agreed to still come back and be on the panel. Uh, give us a little snapshot of what's going on with you right now. Yeah. Um, when this, when the Slow Flower Summit got started uh, for the 2020, I was uh, the horticulturist at Filoli and managing the cutting garden as well as the rose garden and a smaller orchard there. And uh, since then, I accepted a really incredible offer uh, at the University of Washington to pursue a master's in landscape architecture. So I transitioned and am learning a bunch of new tools and skills to broaden uh, my my ability to do design on on an even larger scale. Wow. Yeah. And, And a lot happened in 2020. Yes, you got accepted into grad school, but yes, you went to grad school Against the backdrop of COVID. <laughs> the pandemic, yeah. yeah. So you were mostly virtual? Well, pretty much exclusively virtual. I think I was admittedly um, a little foolhardy in thinking that we would be in person possibly in the fall, and that didn't pan out. But it's it's been a wonderful year. I'm, I'm pretty amazed by how much we're still able to learn in a remote environment and um, how all the students have really come together, like, we do have a community, even though we are remote. So that's mm. been pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. And I've gotten to spend some good time with uh, family and loved ones that would not have been possible. You, you, I remember you mentioning that, that you um, basically could be online from anywhere. So you've kind of been a little bit of a nomad. Yes. But how, yeah. lu- how lucky for us that you're back in the Bay Area in time yeah. to be at the summit and actually gather in person with people. 
Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled. The timing is excellent and it's nice to be in the bay in the spring. This is mm. like the best time of year here. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. fun to be back in the landscape that sort of inspired my love for landscapes. Oh, that's great. And of course, uh, Kelly is nodding because she's, well, not technically in the bay. You're, Kelly, you're based in Santa Cruz, right? Yeah, I am at the University of California, Santa Cruz at the UCSC farm also called the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems. That's a lot. I know. That's a mouthful. The farm is easier. That's kind of how I think of it, too. Kelly and I met, I think, about five years ago. I was invited to teach with Teresa Sabankaya at a workshop at her garden. And and you guys knew each other probably through her buying flowers from the the farm at UC Santa Cruz. I'm not quite sure, but she invited you. And that was really fun uh, to make that connection. And were you, you were on on the staff at UC Santa Cruz then too, right? Yeah, I had just begun and we were really just starting to ramp up our flower program at that time. Mm -hmm. So give us a snapshot of what the flower program is in the context of this larger, you know, educational program for sustainable agriculture. I I mean, does that surprise people when they, because I think... I continually meet alum of that program who are flower farmers who maybe went to the program for food farming and then fell in love with flowers through faculty like you. Yeah, I think it's a surprising element that most folks who come to the program aren't necessarily coming to it for. And then, you know, as folks learn more about flowers, I think many just become completely enchanted and see that it is it is it is actually part of a functional, sustainable um, ecosystem service as part of a, a farm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, it it's really exciting to get to work with folks that are, um, you know, learning about and enjoying flowers for the first time in a really profound way. And I will say that myself included was one of them. I didn't really have that inspiration and connection before um, coming there. And I didn't expect that either. Mm-hmm. And what it, so you were actually a student in the program is, is what you're saying before you joined the staff. Yes, I was. And had you mainly worked in food farming before that? Or what was your path to, to um, you know, want to do that deeper study? I had mainly worked in, in food growing and food production, mostly in sort of community health um, before that. And I, I have to confess that I used to see flowers, you know, I kind of would poo-poo it and think, oh, it's a waste of uh, resources. It's a waste of energy. Um, and when I, when I started um, as a student in the program, I just you know, the, the hands-on experience of working with them and seeing how connected they were to um, a moment in time and a moment in a season and an expression of our land. I just sort of fell in love with that mm. story and experience. Um, mm-hmm. And also just the creative aspect too. I mean, did you consider yourself an artist before you started arranging flowers or was that sort of a like a new window opening up into a, a different world. Well, I actually went to art school. Oh, um, great. So <laughs> my background is in uh, visual arts and photography and sort of design. Um, I don't think I knew that about you, Kelly. That's so cool. Yeah, it's a past life surprise. Um, and so I had always had an interest in, you know, aesthetic and design and played around with flowers just for fun, but I never um, had explored it deeply before. Mm -hmm. But there's some visceral connection. And this is kind of what I want to I want to ask Emily to riff on too. And I think the panel will express this, this visceral connection between when you're growing, quote unquote, your art supplies, and then you're able to create with them. It's, it's so much more meaningful, because there's this, this, this arc, this, this connection to season and um, maybe just the slow, you know, not to go go deep into slow flowers, but like the so slow process of watching that flower come to life and maybe thinking about it as a design element. Um, I don't know. Emily, maybe you can talk a little bit about that too, be- because you also worked um, on flower farms before you went to Philoli, right? 
Yeah, I worked on several different um, flower farms of many different scales around the Bay Area. Um, probably the largest being Fifth Crow Farm over in Pescadero, which at this point I think has like about a 500 person CSA. Wow. Um, that's a, m- mostly a vegetable CSA, but also a very robust flower CSA. And they sell at seven or eight different uh, markets a week. So we that was the most intensive production farm that I worked at where we were really um, making, you know, a couple hundred bouquets every Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday was just, uh, yeah, it was go, go, go. Very, you weren't, you weren't con- contemplating each stem as you we uh, designed <laughs> each stem. But amazingly, you still found, I mean, with the, the, especially the bouquet making days, there was just, there was still so much like wonder and just like this, this joy that would come out even after a 14 hour day, because yeah, you, you had started these uh, plants from seed and been cultivating them through the weeds and uh, just watching them mature and then getting to send them off in these little arrangements to the world was really fun. Yeah. Mm, mm. But so Fifth Crow and also Bluma Farm, which is now on a rooftop. But when I was there, we were in Sonol, uh, which is an ag park over in the East Bay. Mm. That's a pretty cool space. How did the how did the door open to Filoli? And I know you mentioned earlier before we started recording this like passion you have for public gardens. Um, was that one reason why you wanted to, you know, have that experience? Yeah, I was very interested in 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 learning about public gardens and being a gardener in a public garden space and sort of getting to watch that inter something about farming I've always missed is getting to sort of witness the interaction between people and plants. Um, and so being in a public garden afforded me this uh, it's, it's, it makes me sound like a voyeur, but this like beautiful experience of, of getting to witness this connection happening that I think is really impactful. And I, that connection also happens for people, I think, when they're holding a flower arrangement or when they're at a farmer's market. Um, but seeing it and getting to chat with people in the moment in a garden, it was really um, mm-hmm. fun and inspiring. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I ended up finding out about Filoli because they were doing, they used to do an annual floral display around the time of bouquets to art. And I decided to participate uh, just sort of for fun. And when I was wandering around, I'm like, who manages this cutting garden? This is a really cool space. (laughs) It's interesting how you were pulled into that. the, the, The sensation you described watching people uh, experience plants. I sort of feel like Kelly, you get that every day when you're working with students. I mean, your, your, you know, groups might be smaller and, you know, in single chunks of time, but to talk a little bit about how you run, I know things have changed a lot because of transitions at the farm at UC Santa Cruz and the center because of not just COVID, but, you know, some other plants that were going on. What is it like today? And, and how do you, how do the students interact with, you know, the earth and what they're growing? Yeah, um, there have definitely been a lot of changes and we haven't truly opened the farm back up to programming Mm. um, after COVID yet. So a lot has yet to be determined. At the moment, I'm I'm working with just a very small group of students. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but nonetheless, um, I think whoever I'm working with, it's a a really um, special experience when folks are getting to see and develop a relationship with something that they've been working with over time. Um, You know, sort of even deepening that uh, connection that Emily mentioned of how someone is experiencing something. I feel like when a student that we work with gets to plant that thing and then they get to see it and take care of it and build that relationship over the season, there's just something really profound that happens and healing um, Mm -hmm. because I think that, piece of relationship building and connectivity is something that many folks don't have or haven't experienced in the past. Yeah. And just the physical act of learning while doing is, I think, a different learning style that, you know, adults especially don't get to do. And, um, you know, we're behind our desks all the time, as we've all had to do this year. And there's just, I don't know, I think we learn through our hands as well as through our eyes and ears. 
And design is sort of an expression of that. And that kind of leads me to asking you both to talk a little bit about uh, our topic that we're going to dive deep into on the panel at the summit. Uh, Kelly and uh, Emily and our third panelist, Molly uh, Oliver Culver from Molly Oliver Flowers uh, in Brooklyn, are going to talk about how sustainable farming influences them as floral designers. So, um, you know, of course, we all think everyone should have this approach, right? We think every floral designer should be learning how to grow sustainably or at least connect with with growing. But um, what is the, you know, what is the starting point for you as a designer? Kelly, maybe you can go first. Like, are, do you... Um, I, mean, I, I would imagine that you let the flowers tell you what you what you should be doing with them. But what is what is your kind of starting point? Is it color? Is it um, you know an idea of a of a a shape or how do you dive in? Yeah, um, you know when I'm just starting from a blank slate, something that I like to do is walk around the land and really see what is jumping out to me at that Mm -hmm. moment what's really calling me in that moment in time and that particular you know period in the season so um for example right now actually one of my favorite favorite flowers just started blooming the um california matilla hop hoppy Mm. and it actually you know it lasts for a short amount of time as a cut but i think it's just so beautiful that i do like to use it in design Um, and so you know, I just seeing something in the landscape that really connects to me um, and a, a feeling that I want to evoke is the place that I like to begin. Mm-hmm. And that poppy is the, it's, I mean, here in the Pacific Northwest, no one knows what it is. So, I, but I'm familiar with it. It's a, got a big yellow center and really big kind of floppy white petals, right? Is that a fair description? <laughs> It's gorgeous. It's called a fried egg poppy, actually. And it's pretty um, uncharacteristic of a lot of the California natives because it is show- so showy and has such big petals. It's pretty unique. Um, so it's kind of this big, white, delicate tissue paper looking flower mm. with a gorgeous, bright, white, uh, bright yellow center that people you know, like mm-hmm. into a fried egg. Mm-hmm. So you said it doesn't last very long. Are you trying to k- kind of be like... Uh, I don't know, very specific about when you cut it, like, is it only half open? So you get a little bit more lifespan out of it, that sort of thing. Yeah, something that I've loved doing with it is cutting it just at a cracked bud stage when I know that it's going to pop within two to three days and then design with that in mind and then have it be able to open and explode into this beautiful flower in an arrangement. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great approach, especially for something. I'm trying to think of my my version of that here in in my garden would be a, a tree peony, which you know is also got kind of that same big showy vibe, but super short lived in a vase. Um, I love I was it. Going to say a friend of mine recently, who's a wonderful horticulturist down at UCLA Botanic, um, just posted about the the Matilia poppy, saying. It's like the Southern California's response to the peony, which I thought was perfect. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. And the fact that it's native, I think there's sort of that kind of shift happening. Um, you know, Kelly, I interviewed Kelly recently for an article for Johnny Seeds about climate uh, response and, you know, coping with heat and drought and how, what flower farmers are doing. And Kelly, you mentioned a lot of the natives and the pollinator plants that really helped kind of create some resilience um, in, you know, in the grounds at UC Santa Cruz. Is the, would that poppy be one of those? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that we actually don't even necessarily cultivate in our beds. It's something that's actually sort of a hedgerow and in-between space. We don't actually even water it. So wow. it's an incredible plant. Wow, that's cool. Do they ha- are they on the grounds at Filoli, Emily? You know what? I don't think there are any on the grounds at Filoli, actually. I think that Filoli is in this funky little, uh, maybe too moist, too cool window, um, just because of how it's like in this little depression behind Mm -hmm. the mountains, Mm -hmm. that I haven't seen any on Mm -hmm. the grounds there. Mm -hmm. But I know Hidden Villa, I think, which is a, a neighbor just a little further south, 
does have some nearby. So, mm-hmm. so it's a coastal native uh, plant. Then it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it a little bit more in Lind as well too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you the same question, Emily, that I asked Kelly. Like, how? What is your approach to design um, after production market bouquets, and then, you know, estate landscape gardening where did floral design fill in for you how did how did it kind of emerge through those experiences yeah I think that um it 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 similarly kind of it it emerged from observing just space you know observing either on the farm scale or the estate garden scale or just the landscapes around that I hike through in the bay area Um, observing space and this excitement to kind of like respond through arranging um, to to the land around me Mm -hmm. and so I I feel like I'll I'll start in many different ways sometimes it's color and it's hiking around and the same colors I realize are kind of sitting in my brain um, from walking and then they'll, they'll I'll see them come through in an arrangement or sometimes it's walking in the field. When I used to be at Filoli at the end of the day, I would definitely walk the cutting gardens and just let myself move bed to bed, just whatever was kind of calling out. And um, yeah. I mean, how cool that you both come from these experiences where there wasn't a shortage of botanical uh, material to, to play with. Whereas, you know, you didn't have to worry even about, I mean, I don't know if this is fair to say, but like, uh, budget or stem count and like all the things that, uh, you know, if maybe a studio florist would have to worry about or a retail florist would have to worry about in terms of, you know, just the, just the cost of flowers. Um, is that fair to say? I'm not trying to put it on you like as like you're spoiled or something, but it's, it's a luxury. It's a, it's a privilege, I think. Absolutely. I think it is really lucky. And I think we also designed our landscape with that in mind. You know, we designed plants that would be there long term as perennials that would be sturdy and have a lot of um, material and also provide other um, services to Mm. our landscape. Mm -hmm. Um, So in that way, and we kind of think about how we have blooms across the year. Um, So it is a privilege and it's really great to have that. And it's something that we're thinking about as we design that landscape. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you mentioned that you're really um, expanding the perennial section just because you're trying to be conscious of, you know, the inputs that it takes to grow, you know, every, every season, you know, with annual crops and that sort of thing. Is that, is that kind of the reason? I, obviously you love perennials too. So it's, it's, for the beauty of them. Yeah, it, it's a little bit of both. Um, we There's just so many unique and beautiful perennials, I think. Um, and we are trying to sort of streamline our growing areas and try out a new system. Um, so in that vein, you know, we're designing these strips of perennials within our annual growing blocks that can sort of stay there year round as almost mini hedgerows Mm -hmm. that we can both cut from as well as, you know, rely on them for food and habitat for pollinators and Mm -hmm. other beneficial insects. So like what would be in a a perennial strip? Um, You know, just, is it a mix of, of, uh, or flowering plants and fruiting plants or is it truly, you know, what you would call a perennial flower? I don't think that it's what a lot of designers might necessarily think of as a perennial flower. Um, we are, you know, it would be a mix of things. We're looking at a lot of California natives. So for instance, you know, yarrow might be a good uh, one that's going to be included. We have different types of buckwheat. Um, Another thing, you know, we're also looking at things that will produce greenery for us. So Mm -hmm. like the roos, um, the California native, which is another thing that we're looking at. Mm. Um, That's cool. Yeah. It's your definition of a perennial border. (laughs) Not like something you'd see at, uh, I don't know, Sissinghurst or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> be kind of, mm-hmm. um, but that's so appropriate to place, and that's the whole point of of you know what it draws us to seasonality and um, you know in 
the 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 native plants influencing um, a perennial border is really cool to think about. And then we go over to a place like Filoli where it's pretty artificial, but you're also trying to bring some of that that value of sustainability and more climate resilient plants into, I mean, I think when you were there, Emily, that was something you guys were working on, right? Yeah, definitely. I think that in a lot of ways, Filoli also has the, one of the benefits of Filoli is that it is designed as like a perennial garden. It's, it's, it has year round interest at the time of design that was not done to think about resilience that was done for sort of the, 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 for the human lens of like having something always to Mm -hmm. work with and look at, but it was very explicitly done with flower arranging in mind because there were always flower arrangements year round happening in the house. Um, So there's a pretty big range of perennial things to cut from as well as annuals. And then there's just this massive uh, wild, largely unmanaged landscape also around, um, But I would say that while Filoli is maybe heavy on some of the English garden cottage plants that are a little water heavy, um, and I'm not always a fan of for our climate here in California, we were trying to think of uh, ways to reduce water. And I was really pushing that while I was there. And I went a few weeks ago and, and visited and they were finishing up installing some of the drip irrigation in all the cages um, and converting over because we they still use sprinklers when I started at the cutting garden in Filoli. So making making yeah. trans making progress, yeah. cover started cover cropping, doing mulching. Um, yeah. And maybe those are some of those farming techniques that you brought to, you know, a, a cultivated perennial, you know, estate garden that you know just it's like a whole different practice that but is obviously applicable. Yeah, I think totally applicable. I mean, and and I think it's really cool what Kelly's talking about, that they're thinking about these perennial spaces almost more than the annual spaces, because especially as we move towards more unstable climates, it's like those are the spaces that are providing um, both nourishment for us as humans, but also for all of these different plant and animal species. And I think but biodiversity is just, it's a win-win all around. And we really need to think about that, the, the perennial space as the space to really dig in and celebrate, I think. I love that. It kind of, it's kind of the opposite of instant gratification. <laughs> That's what I meant about truly slow. <laughs> it definitely is. Some of these perennials take us a couple years to establish before we can really cut from them. I do want to ask you both about roses because I know that you both, I know that at the farm I, there, people were learning how to grow garden roses as cuts. And I know that at Filoli, I mean, that was a couple of years ago when I visited Kelly. So correct me if I'm wrong. And I know that Filoli is like, oh, I've got a rose explosion going on. So where do roses fit in in terms of either how can you sustainably grow roses and also use them for design or, you know, what role do they play? Obviously, these are we're talking garden roses and not production roses. You guys still doing them at the farm, Kelly? We have a few, um, mostly in the Chadwick Garden. They have a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, and it's not something I specialize or teach around as much. Um, and so I, while I do appreciate them, I, I usually find myself drawn to other flowers mm-hmm. a little bit. More. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're, I mean, you might use them in design if you had a, like a, a, a commission or a custom order for something, uh, you're able to incorporate them. Yeah. Yeah. How about, how about you, Emily? What's your, lo- what's your relationship with the roses at Filoli yeah, and beyond? Think, <laughs> roses at Filoli were something that was a challenge just because we never had enough time to deadhead them as much as we wanted. I think they have around 300 roses in the rose garden. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was the area of the garden that we always wanted to do more and never could do enough. Um, But I do think that roses can be grown relatively sustainably depending on the, on the type. I mean, they can be super drought tolerant, And um, there also are some wild roses that I think are like the Rosa Californica is it has some amazing hips, like the the little fruit hips at the end of the season are gorgeous and huge. 
Um, they are very sharp and have a lot of thorns, but I know in Washington, I was blown away by the, uh, the Rosa, I want to say Nutcana was mm-hmm. the one up there. Mm-hmm. Huge. I mean, huge single petal, like huge old rose variety with amazing gigantic hips. Yeah, so the I hips think- are like eating a, like a miniature orange or something or yeah. apple. Yeah. And and I don't think any of those plants receive, they don't receive, they don't receive water or care. So I think that there are a lot of roses that can really get by. And that's why they've been so successful over their um, long relationship with humans. Cause they, they're very resilient. Plants. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You're, you're cluing me into just sort of a different approach and also mentioning the hips and hearing Kelly talk about the Matalia poppy, it's like you guys are observing plants at all stages and finding beauty in, you know, not the mainstream floral palette. And I, I'm hoping that your the designs that we uh, see you do at um, at the summit will have a little hint of of your own aesthetic and uh, based on what you're able to you know work with. I I'll try to get some really funky, unusual things in a bucket for each of you. <laughs> So it'll be really fun. Um, well, this has been such a great conversation. I, I just think it's um, increasingly the farming world and the floral design world are getting closer together, at least in our circles and in, in the Slow Flowers community and uh, people who are, you know, just motivated by um, knowing where and how their flowers are, are grown and also farmers who are appreciative of the design process. So... Uh, I think I think it's going to be a great celebration, and I appreciate you both being uh, willing to hang in there with us for 12 additional months while we're trying to get this summit off the ground. We are we're psyched, and it's going to be COVID compliant, social distancing practices all in, uh, instituted, and open air. And we actually um, are getting really excited about it. So I'm glad that you'll we'll see you both soon. Any any closing thoughts you want to share with? Um, this conversation before we wrap up. Um, I'm I'm really excited to be at the summit. I feel like it's been a big span of time since people have really kind of experienced the beauty and joy of like floral design just because there haven't been events. And so this is, it feels like it's going to be really special and exciting. Mm, Good. I'm glad. I'm glad that you're part of it. Yeah. Um, I would echo that. I think it's just going to be really exciting to um, gather and celebrate flowers and gardens and landscape. Yeah, I think there's going to be a good, you know, uh, weird masked experience. But you know, we can, we're still going to make connections and have good conversations. And just I think we're all kind of forgetting that that's just part of everyday life now. And uh, we can still function and, you know, (laughs) <laughs> just cope with that while we're trying to have, uh, you know, a conference and hear from speakers and, um, and network. And it's just going to be just against the backdrop of, you know, a beautiful space like Filoli. It's going to be mind blowing. So I will see you both very soon. Um, I have photos of both of you. I have photos of your designs. I'll share some of that with our, um, our listeners in our show notes uh, at DebraPrinzing.com for today's episode. And we will, um, I'm going to add a a link to a past interview I did with Molly because she um, got off schedule today and wasn't able to join us. But I know some of you have heard me talk with her before. So we'll, uh, until we're all together, thanks again. And I really appreciate both of you so much. Thank you so much, Debra. Thanks so much for joining our conversation today. There are still a few spaces left to attend the Slow Flowers Summit, and you can find all those details at slowflowerssummit.com or in today's show notes. We are also excited to welcome our attendees to a safe, in-person, COVID-compliant, and mostly outdoor setting at Filoli Historic House and Garden. The countdown begins. Our next sponsor thanks goes to the Gardener's Workshop, which offers a full curriculum of online education for flower farmers and farmer florists. Online education is more important this year than ever, and you'll want to check out the course offerings at thegardenersworkshop.com.
I've got a few announcements to share. If you missed last week's Slow Flowers member virtual meetup with Beth Van Sant of Scenic Place Peonies and Brandon Scott McLean of East Hill Floral, two peony experts from Homer, Alaska, we have the playback video to share with you. You can find the link in today's show notes. And be sure to save the date for our June 11th virtual meetup. More details are coming, but the theme will be American Flowers Week. Speaking of American Flowers Week, which takes place June 28th to July 4th each year, we're heading into our seventh annual campaign. I want to share an invitation specifically for flower farmers who may be planning a special promotion, pop-up sale, workshop, or other activity to celebrate American Flowers Week. I've agreed to write a story about what flower farmers are doing during the campaign for an upcoming issue of Growing for Market. And I'm looking for ways to feature you and your plants. So please get in touch if you have something in the works that you want to share. You can shoot me a note at debra at slowflowers.com. I'd love to hear from you. And finally, we have just drawn the winners for the May 12th book giveaway featuring Nikki Irving's new book, Growing Flowers. Nikki is a longtime Slow Flowers member, a farmer florist, and owner of Flourish Flower Farm in Asheville, North Carolina. We discussed Growing Flowers, her first ever book, and issued a giveaway challenge to our listeners. Thanks to the generous donation from Mango Publishing, we have two copies of Nikki's book to give away to listeners. We ask you to post a photo of one or more of the flowers you're growing and use the hashtag Growing Flowers, as well as tagging Flourish Flower Farm, Slow Flower Society, and Mango Publishing. We rounded up all of your posts and did a random drawing for the two books. Congratulations to Jenny Hulbert and to Flower Folly Farm. We'll be in touch to get your address for receiving a free copy of Growing Flowers. I know you'll enjoy Nikki's new book. Our final sponsor thanks goes to the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. Formed in 1988, ASCFG was created to educate, unite, and support commercial cut flower growers. Its mission is to help growers produce high quality floral material and to foster and promote the local availability of that product. Learn more at ASCFG.org. Thanks so much for joining us today. The Slow Flowers podcast has been downloaded more than 730,000 times by listeners like you. Thank you for listening, commenting, and sharing. It means so much. As our movement gains more supporters and more passionate participants who believe in the importance of our domestic cut flower industry, the momentum is contagious. I know you feel it too. I value your support and invite you to show your thanks supporting Slow Flowers' ongoing advocacy, education, and outreach activities. You can find the donate button in the column to the right at deborahprinzing.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing, host and producer of the Slow Flowers podcast. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more Slow Flowers on the table, one vase at a time. And if you like what you hear, please consider logging onto iTunes and posting a listener review. The content and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. The Slow Flowers podcast is engineered and edited by Andrew Brenlin. Learn more about his work at soundbodymovement.com. Thank you.